A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 95th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. More than a year ago, in April 2020, when this pandemic had just hit our country, schools had shut down, Together for Education was set up with the motive of having our educators form a closer community and have them better used to these new learning methods that were coming up. Zoom was quickly becoming popular, and we said, why not set up a webinar series, which will help our educators get on Zoom twice a week, get more hands-on with the system, and also in the process, create this community of educators who can discuss and debate various aspects of school education. More than a year later, we are looking at the same health problem, this severe pandemic that plagues the country, and perhaps in a way that's much worse than last year's. So we at Notebook hope that you, your students, your colleagues, your loved ones are all safe and secure and are taking adequate precautions to battle this pandemic. Today, more than a year from our starting point, we have been able to connect with more than 70,000 educators from across the globe. This event that has been taking place twice every week has only grown thanks to your love and support. And we look forward to your support in the weeks to come. Today is the 95th edition, and we are going to look at a topic that is perhaps something that we have all discussed with our friends in informal chats, responsible consumption. In today's parlance, almost seems like an oxymoron. One of the United Nations SDGs is about consumption, and we wanted to explore how our school system works around this topic. Our first speaker today, is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. He qualified as a leadership trainer at the Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He is also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we at Notebook are privileged to have him as a senior advisor on our panel of advisors. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Bayou, for that introduction. And a very good evening to you and the entire um, Notebook family, uh, Achin, uh, Abhishek, Meghna, and all those who I have never met, and to our esteemed panelists, um, 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 Pam Coutinho and Chohan, and to all those guests who have tuned in today. Uh, this topic, in some way, is related to our last webinar, uh, where, we where we discussed climate action in schools. Uh, today, we speak about consumerism, and surely there's a link between consumerism and uh, climate uh, uh, responsibility because um, consumerism is what is bringing the earth down to its knees. In fact, if um, if you look at the Ten Commandments, I think if 11th had to be added to them, it should be thou shalt not destroy the earth and only take what you need from it. But um, I remember my first economics class where the professor said that man's needs are unlimited and that's what um, leads to consumerism. So greed has no limits. Uh, look around what's happening in these COVID times. Uh, people are hoarding, stockpiling, stocking up medicines and other uh, gadgetry which they don't require. Uh, food scientists uh, might have proved Malthus wrong and despite the population growing in the world and in, on our earth, there is still plenty of food around. But with our soils being exhausted the way they are of nutrients, a carrot 60 years ago when I was a kid is not the same and does not give you the same nutrition as a GM modified hybrid variety. And therefore, illnesses and low immunity for, for, the, for the modern kid. Now, I am lucky. I live in a very beautiful part of the town of Dehradun, oh, and I overlook the Masuri Hills, and there's a forest that stretches from the you know, front gates of my house. And I saw two women, local women, uh, goat herds, uh, climbing a tree in slippers with a sickle 
and they were lopping off trees from the forest, leaves from the forest trees for their goats. And they dropped these twigs and of course they tied these leaves into little bundles using the strip of the bark and they left with just enough for their needs. There was no plastic, no picnic litter, no french fries, no footprints. They just took from the earth what it offered them. And I think we can all learn from these people. They live in harmony with nature and they take and replace what they use. Uh, just the way the Red Indians do it and the tribal people of India, the, Hathi, the Adivasis, the Hottentots, they all have this ability to thank the Lord for the food that they kill and which feeds their, their families. Um, I think they, um, uh, I think it, they are sensitive to nature. They they love animals, and children love animals. They hate they hate uh, they hate animals to be hurt to be hurt. So I think we need to draw a link between the squealing, uh, slaughtered slaughtered animal, and the juicy burger on the plate. Now, some of the things that schools can do to bring about you know a uh, responsible con uh, consumerism, and and I think the first is food. I think. Most of our modern children have very, very indisciplined eating habits. Their fast foods, their fizzy drinks, it's full of sugar. Uh, they eat a lot of meat. Um, their canteens and their kitchens are, you know, they get appendicitis, they're eating too late. Um, and, you know, most adolescents get easily bored. They, they, they don't get fired up all the time. And therefore, whenever they're bored, they want to eat. They go out. There's plenty of places to eat. And um, that's what happens. And it's us adults, teachers, who have to bring in food experts and nutritionists into our school canteen, into our homes, and teach these children that there is something that titillates your palate and there's something that really nourishes the body. And I think they have to make the difference between this. Um, I have seen a lot of overconsumption with food and I think disciplined eating is important. The other thing is I think reading and what they're watching. There is hardly any control uh, in what they're watching and what they're reading. And just as you would not put out to a child's canteen or dining hall wrong foods, over fried foods, similarly you wouldn't put into library pornography and, un and you know unsavory literature, nor would you make them consume videos and 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 the program which are which are which are harmful to them you know which are pornographic i think this is one thing that adults have abdicated their rights and power over children uh, for peace in the family for no quarrels i think fa fathers and mothers today have settled for let them do what they want as long as they're doing well in their studies and i think this tacit agreement between parent and child is what is ruining them so the parents are not not, 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 not being firm enough with what they're watching, what they're reading, what they're eating. The other thing is spending money. And I think it's important to teach children that there is a responsible way of spending money. This is what you get as an allowance. You can spend it in a day. You can spend it over a month. But it's up to you. You can't keep coming and asking uh, for everything you want. But this is the way the modern parent shows love. They don't have time, so they have money. I think it's better they spend quality time with them. The other thing that they are over consuming is paper and water. These are two very limited and interconnected resources. If you look at the poor and the marginalized and the tribal communities, they don't spend, they don't use paper in any, any form. But you take an affluent home, there's wrapping paper, there's cooking paper, there's newspapers, there's a host of magazines, there is shopping bags, gift wrapper and paper, there's toilet paper, tissue paper, and so many more things. A lot of books and water. I think schools need to, you know, start from early uh, telling these children how they have to put off water and put off taps. I think they can invest in, you know, taps that switch off automatically, you know, uh, photoelectric cell operated. Um, again, so paper and, and water are two things that we are over consuming. The other thing is internet space. Uh, children in schools, once boys in my school went back to their houses, it is very slow. The internet didn't work because they occupied so much bandwidth. 
doing what? Watching movies, um, looking at things they shouldn't be doing. So children at home must be taught how to share internet space with the other siblings, with their parents. Um, electricity, again, we, we talked about this in the last webinar. I think there should be competitions in school about which school has a higher electricity bill. I think parents must make children uh, conscious of what they're paying for their electricity. ACs and heaters are on throughout the day. Petrol is another, you know, kids want to be driven to every place. They can't walk. Uh, they don't want carpools. Uh, it's a status symbol to have a car and a chauffeur. And so they, they spend petrol thinking that, um, you know, it's one of those infinite resources. But it's not. India imports almost 80% of its petrol needs. And, and these modern kids want to be driven to every place. How to spend time? I think another responsible learning for children is time. Time is again, uh, you know, you've got to spend and break a day into so many, um, so many segments. Uh, you can't oversleep. You can't overread or overstudy. I think it's important for us to advise children and teach children that you have to consume time responsibly. Look at a child's cupboard and clothes. Is, does he need all those clothes, all those shoes? Uh, who is telling them what to buy and how much to buy? Is that a form of love? Uh, look at their rooms. They're cluttered with, with toys and paraphernalia and bric-a-brac. Can't they give it away to children uh, who are less fortunate, who, who need secondhand or hand-me-down things? Uh, look at their rooms. It's full of clutter. Where is the responsible consumerism there? Now, people say that man will destroy the earth. I don't think that's true. The earth can never be destroyed. Even concrete will regenerate after 10,000 years. What's going to happen is man will destroy man. The earth will regenerate, trees will grow, and it will become the, the great world that we know before man came. It's not man will not destroy the earth. Uh, he will destroy himself. Children learn from us. They imitate us adults. Often, we want to have more because having more uh, is therefore consuming more is a status symbol of our success of where we reached and life in a consumer society where money needs to be circulated and the human propensity to want more this this insatiable drive comes from us and the children are seeing what we are doing as a teacher in an expensive school that i finished in egalitarianism was one of the pillars that our school stood on and yet it was such an uphill task for us to, to make sure that children didn't flaunt their, their, their wealth. But they showed it in so many subtle ways. The watches they wore, the rackets they used, the colognes they splashed on, the pens, I mean, a Mont Blanc and a, and a, and a throwaway Camelin, big difference. They even had designer spectacles, um, the, spectacle frames. Um, so there's so many ways in which we consume more than we need just to flaunt our status and ego and our symbols. Who's giving them the money for this? How are they getting all these fancy gadgets? And Warren Buffett once said that if we are going to spend money on what we don't need today, we will have to sell what we need tomorrow. As we grow old and grow up, I think we need to realize that all life is a casting off that we can live with much less than we, are, than we need. And uh, you know, if you look at Schumacher's great book, small is beautiful, small is beautiful. And you're rich in proportion to the things that you can do without. So how can we instill a sense of simplicity, frugality into our young generation? I would say reward the desired behavior with children are simple and frugal and don't waste and don't clamor for more. I think that behavior should be rewarded. Then I think practice the three R's. Reduce waste, reuse resources, and recycle materials. And redress the problems when it arises. So if you see a child wasting, consuming too much, I think he needs to be confronted lovingly at that point. And lastly, I think our role as role models and our behavior needs to lead the way. We, uh, we, we, we must limit our own needs and our own greeds 
for the children of tomorrow to learn from us. Thank you very much for listening, Subayu, and I'm handing this over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, week after week, it has been our privilege to have you open these sessions, and your views always set the stage for the discussion to follow. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Ochin. Ochin Patacharya is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, he was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CP Australia. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Should I am audible? Yeah, Ochin, loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic which perhaps is very important for creating a better world. Let me begin with a very uh, very appropriate quote by a former US Attorney General, William Rachelschus. The quote goes as follows. He said, nature provides a free lunch. Nature provides a free lunch, but only if we control our appetite. So I think very, very beautifully summed up, right? On that note, let me begin my deliberation. Let's discuss a, a hypothetical scenario. Imagine, imagine uh, any of us, we decide to buy a new t-shirt. So what do we do? We, we drive to our favorite shop, we look at the choice they offer. And again, after looking at it, trying few of them, we, we narrow it down. We narrow down our options. And suppose we have two options, two t-shirts. And then we find that they are more or less equally good. So we are trying to decide. And then suppose one of them, one of these t-shirts, comes from a company that is known, a brand that is known for decent working conditions in terms of its production facilities, uh, in terms of its policy of not employing child labor, paying fair wages, not using toxic chemicals for coloring. Maybe the t-shirt is made from organic cotton, cotton. And the t-shirt on the other hand, say we have two choices, one, you know, ethical practices, ethical production, sustainable way of working. And the second one, maybe we have seen reports in the media sometimes back that the brand is quite notorious for running a sweatshop. You know, pathetic working conditions, maybe employing child labor, uh, not paying fair wages, using toxic chemical, which are not organic, maybe harmful to the skin, but not sure. But of course, you know, the second brand may not be, may not be playing by the rule book. Things, business practices may not be ethical and sustainable. Now, as I told you in the beginning, maybe uh, both of this more or less look and feel the same. So what would we do in such a situation? Will we pick up Will we pick up the t-shirt which comes from a brand which is more ethical? I'm sure most of us here would do it. We would make a choice responsibly. At least for sure, a majority of us would definitely do it. Now think of the last time when we actually bought something. We actually bought a t-shirt, a shirt, something. Did we really take this factor into consideration? Did we really look at uh, the social and 
environmental aspects of our decision? Did you really think about the social environmental performance of the brand or any other object? Say last time you brought a computer, a smartphone. Did you really check about the human right conditions in terms of where this product is being produced? Maybe not, in spite of our best intentions. So intentions are good, but practically it didn't happen with many of us. But why so? This is what you know we call as the intention behavior gap. So the intention is there, but it doesn't actually and practically reflect in terms of behavior. So we have the best of intentions, but when it comes to taking decisions, actual real life decision making, we tend to forget about it. We tend to ignore it. We tend to overlook it. Why so? But why does it happen? What, what really drives this gap? Why does this gap exist? The gap between intention and behavior. You know, is it so that we did not have information? Like if we were more informed, would we take more responsible decisions? Now, uh, let me share a real life incident. I'm sure many, many esteemed educators in this forum would remember in news reports in 2013, maybe around April 2013, when a garment factory collapsed in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I'm sure many of us uh, saw those pictures, you know. And at that point of time, various news reports uh, that came in print and audiovisual media, names of uh, some of the famous brands, brands that we find when, whenever we walk into any, any mall or a departmental store, we see these brands in shelf. So many of these brands were being produced there. Maybe, maybe without knowing, maybe before this particular incident came to the limelight, many of us, many of us had actually had actually purchased from these brands and maybe afterwards as well let me tell you another story i'm sure many of us would, would read here the story about foxconn yes you are completely right foxconn the brand which produces smartphones computers in fact they produce smartphones for uh, some of the biggest brands in the world, including Apple and Samsung. We, we, we read about their factory. Workers actually jumping from the roof of the factory. Now why so? Because of desperation, because of pathetic working conditions. We read about it. We exactly know how, how this works. Now, Various incidents like this. We have heard about stories about child labor. We have heard about stories about slave labor. Say industries like chocolate, sugar, gold, you name it. You name it and we all know it exists. We all know uh, many kind of unethical practices in different industries. For instance, we might be the last generation eating tuna fish. We cannot claim that we have not heard about these things. You know, if, you know, honestly speaking, that will be too unbelievable a claim. So hence information is not the problem. Information is there. We need to accept it. But what happens is all of us, uh, we, we tend to blame someone and somewhere else. Instead of trying to, trying to hold a mirror and trying to understand whether our decision is rational enough or not. So at times we blame the company, we blame the corporate, we say it is their production problem. So we want them to change their behavior, which is true, of course, of course, they have responsibility, undoubtedly. But the fact is, if you look at our insatiable urge, insatiable urge to consume more and more at an increasingly higher speed, and at ever low prices. So definitely we are part of the problem. We cannot, we cannot deny, we cannot ignore. And it is not just about improving the current working conditions, current production conditions. It is also about changing the culture of consumption. So 
you know this gap between intention and behavior that i was discussing about most of the time when we make decisions as consumers we we, we do it automatically right it's like an autopilot mode we don't think so much it's routine you know and and that happens to all of us habit can be at times much stronger than reason so if we really want to make our consumption more sustainable we have to we have to reprogram our habits so for instance you must imagine like say for instance a habit is like an iceberg when you see on the surface what you see on the surface what you see on the surface is the behavior what you cannot see under the water are the values and beliefs that actually drive that behavior so we see the behavior but what lies underneath are the values and belief far more important so if you want to change someone's habit undoubtedly instead of changing the habit we need to you know instead of changing the behavior we need to target the values for instance uh, we all know that it's illegal to smoke in public places so if you tell someone not to smoke you directly target the behavior but what about values and belief for instance for instance uh, if you look at if you look at our own rich past traditions as a civilization or the old ancient greek and roman societies who were guided by strong mythologies you know but when we discuss about mythologies great storytelling cultures and the storytelling cultures helped in inculcating values which influenced behaviors for instance for instance we were discussing about uh, trying to stop smoking now look at what the tobacco industry does in terms of their advertisement campaign you know they they they, they create a story they create a story for instance for teenagers they create a story of being cool uh trying to trying to grow up being an adult that's exactly what the teenagers want at times for women they might try to create a story of emancipation for for instance for for marginalized for poor people say for in a country like africa they will use the story of european prosperity like for instance you can the, the subtle messaging is you can reach it in little bit if you start smoking now imagine the power of these stories the problem of the sustainability movement the problem of responsible consumption is that it has no stories to tell now unless and until stories are powerful enough how do we counter this how do we really counter this because this is this is really important right we just can't believe we just can't depend on technology we just can't believe that uh, technology will make our production system more efficient produce at more higher speed and lower cost see any technology at the end of the day is man made and the person who is behind the technology what are his beliefs what are his values that undoubtedly affects the technology right at the end of the day what is it that the society wants any corporate is out there to serve the society so at the end of the day the society's values and beliefs which will drive their behavior is going to influence production mechanisms is going to influence consumptions pattern around the world now why do we buy stuff do we buy stuff because by buying something we want to be like someone else or does it really increase our happiness now these are the really uh, important thing like for instance we were discussing about a t-shirt we were discussing about a t-shirt so when we consume more at times it gives us some kind of an instant gratification but today people are intelligent enough to understand that when we consume more we can increase our happiness only to a certain degree then it falls down then it is bound to fall down for instance if someone smokes beyond a point he or she may unfortunately unfortunately get cancer fast food junk food too much of chocolates unfortunately may end up with diabetes buying stuff all the time at times people may feel empty drained lead to depression so 
as far as society is concerned, all these consumption decisions aggregate in large scale environmental problems. The last day we were discussing forest disappearing, ice melting, in few decades, cities underwater, leading to migration, more poverty. We discussed, right? So, so what I was trying to tell you is that uh, there are many small, small factors of, of, of responsible consumption. Small, very small, as small as uh, when we leave our office or home, do we remember to uh, switch off the light? Very small, but very important. Very, very important. If you look at it from a collective standpoint as a society, it really shows our values, our belief system, our responsibility. Now, uh, what is telling you, which I think, I think is really important. Now, I'll tell you a, a different story. Like I was telling you about stories that the need for stories to be more believable. Now I'll tell you a story, very believable. Might be a bit abstract, but let me tell you about this. Now, if we hear that in our neighborhood, a new fast food restaurant is opening up, what do we do? Suppose for instance, uh, even if we are not very fond of fast food, we may not go there, but honestly, we don't care. But this is a story about someone who got really angry when he heard that McD, McDonald's was opening a new restaurant at the Spanish Steps in Rome. Now, for many of the esteemed educators here, I'm sure we'll know that Spanish Steps in Rome is at the heart of cultural heritage of Italy. Now, Italians are very much opposed to fast foods and they're very proud of their own food. The guy that I'm discussing about, his name was Carlo Pertini. And he channeled his anger. How did he channel his anger? He created a movement and that's called slow food movement. Now slow food movement, slow food movement basically is a movement that fights, that fights against this broad nexus of industrialized mechanical food production and mindless unhealthy food consumption. So thus, so from, from Mosantos to McDonald's, the movement was created by, as I told you, Carlo Pertini, because he believed that we have to change the way we eat. We have to eat local food, healthy food, and we have to protect our biodiversity, our cultural heritage, and we have to recreate the link which is lost between the producer and the consumer. We have to educate consumers and producers to change their habit. The story started as, as a very little Italian story, Italian episode. It has become a huge global movement with more than, its presence in more than 150 countries now, more than a lakh people being involved. But why did the story become so powerful? So we were discussing about uh, the importance of stories in terms of driving values and ultimately influencing behavior. So why did this particular movement gather momentum, gather steam? What is the secret sauce? What, why is it so successful? The story is so powerful because we all can connect to it. And why so? We, have cons we, all, we all, we are concerned about the health of our own children. We all know, like Bharat was discussing about you know, ill effects of fast food, we all know. It's not good for our children. Hence, we connect to it. Many of us hate the growing influence of multinationals on the way we eat junk food. So we connect to it. Now, if you are someone who, who, who really wants to promote local traditions, you connect to it because we are discussing about something local, something traditional. If you are someone who wants to preserve biodiversity, you connect to it. If you want to, if you want to help you know, marginalized farmers who are not getting a proper price for their produce, for their hard work, in your native place, at the end of the supply chain of a production system, you connect to it. So we all can somehow connect to the story through our own beliefs and values in that very moment. That's what started as a very small Italian episode trend turned into a trans-cultural movement because it is a story that speaks to everyone potential. So we understand that what really works, right? 
this is this is the what really works so we need to ask yourselves how can we really inspire people how can we inspire our students how can we inspire the society at large as a journalist how do they inspire their readers as a politician how do they inspire citizens now we just can't continuously depend on technology to solve all our problem good old storytelling is very very important the soft power of storytelling so i'd like to end with a quote again by ef schumacher german british statistician and economist a very appropriate quote again infinite growth of infinite growth of material consumption in a finite world is an impossibility i think that sums it up really well i thank all of you for giving me patient hearing we have a wonderful panel today a great panel and i look forward to the deliberation on this topic over to you shubhai thank you washin thank you for that wonderful presentation well from stories from around the world we move to our next speaker who's a very very special guest that we have with us today our next speaker is dr sister christine kutinu sister kutinu is the principal of the loreto college in kolkata she did most of her studies in mumbai she was schooled at loreto convent school chembur graduated with zoology chemistry physics from university of bombay did her post graduation with zoology from university of bombay and she completed her phd in zoology physiology ecotoxicology along with her bed degree and an ma in education she has been a lecturer in ramnarayan guya college and st xavier's college mumbai she was missioned with administration and teaching in loreto asansol loreto entali loreto house loreto college darjeeling loreto dharmtala loreto lucknow before being missioned to loreto college kolkata as principal she has guided several research projects and published academic research papers in international journals she is an naac peer team member and a life member of indian association for water pollution control iawpc ma'am thank you so much for making the time and being on this platform over to you thank you very much i am indeed honored to be invited by notebook and i thank notebook team for asking me to speak uh shubhayu thank you very much i now start referring to my co panelists Dr. Bharat and Bhattacharya too, for having introduced the session so beautifully. I'm a teacher, an ordinary teacher, passionate about what I do, and so I bring before you all that I have learned over the several years of teaching. I'm aware that I'm preparing students to face the future. and while doing so there are contrary messages in the media neighbors envy owners pride keeping with the joneses and many more i feel personally to reason with students discuss with them and discern with them accompanying them along understanding of where they are heading through what they are doing what they are thinking is the key to helping them realize that responsible consumption is important a grandmother once advised her granddaughter as to living to a ripe old age with peace in the heart she said worry less play more ride less walk more frown less smile more drink less breathe more eat less chew more waste less save more preach less and do more as i was reflecting on this little message that the grandmother had i realized how important it is for us teachers i am also aware it is important for us for parents too and we teachers are also parents parents to our students i'm sure all teachers believe in living by example 
to be role models, something mentioned earlier, role models to our students. When one is young, one feels that one will live forever. And hence, everything is at their beck and call. Snap the fingers and hey presto, everything comes alive. It's only when one moves on in years that one realizes the shortness of life and that the earth and all that we think that belongs to humankind and to inheritance subsequently will fade away and what sustainability will leave behind for the next generation is another question. As teachers, I believe that pupils need to realize that running after acquisition will not lead to lasting happiness. It is only by curtailing one's desires that happiness comes to live within. It is in the cultivation of gratitude that one realizes all that we've received, we don't deserve that. It is a gratuitous gift from the Almighty. It is in the cultivation of living in moderation, consuming in moderation, that one learns to value what one has. It is in the cultivation of introspection and reflection on one's needs as against one's wants that one grows in contentment. I cannot but help thinking of something I saw not so long ago. Children on the pavement playing with a piece of wood from a fruit box with a ball prepared out of plastic bags rolled together with raffia. They were so happy. It takes so little to be happy, to make children happy. It is in encountering the less privileged that one realizes that one can thank the Almighty for blessings small and big that we've received. Wasn't it Alexander MacLean who said, whatever one does not have, one does not require. And maybe I can add in faith, providence provides at the right time. It may not be at the time we want, but at the right time. To be attuned to that quiet, inner, still voice in the cave of one's heart, telling us what to do and what not to do, that is responsibility towards the earth and all that the earth offers us. To look towards sustainability, I think we can look to nature. Look at the birds, the animals. They take what they need and they leave the rest back. So this, I feel, is responsible consumption. At the same time, as parents, for us to appreciate our daughters, our sons, talents, innate gifts, will help them grow up in confidence of themselves, competing with themselves without looking at the other for competition. This brings deep inner seated contentment. And it is this contentment, not complacency, contentment that will take them far. On the one hand, 
while parents appreciate their gifts and talents, the gifts and talents of their children, let them challenge them to better themselves. And when they do measure up to the challenge, appreciation goes a long way in helping children go further. Another point I feel is moving with the times, talking of technology, to use as much technology as one needs, as much of bandwidth as my reader, the, the previous speaker said, as one needs, and leave the rest for the others, other siblings, the other members of the family is important. And again, to do things congruous with the times to talk less and to do more. This, when you, real, when you realize this, we realize our own responsibility in shaping our country, in nation building, and for a brighter, better tomorrow. Shubayu, are you there? Yes, I'm right here. Right, over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for making the time and for being here with us today. I think everybody here stands at rich from all those wonderful views you shared. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a fantastic panel discussion lined up after this. But before we go on to that, a little bit about Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech organization. We make small videos pertaining to the school curriculum. That means that every chapter from the various subjects right from classes 1 through to 12, have been converted into short videos for use of both teachers and students. Teachers have access to these videos inside the classroom, be it an online or an offline classroom. You can play these videos as an introduction to the topic that you're teaching that day. The student also has access to the same videos on their personal devices at home. So the student who perhaps missed a bit of the class or does not remember something specific you taught that day, can watch that same video on a smartphone or laptop that they have at home and get reminded of what was taught in class by you on that particular day. What I will do now is play you a very short sample of one of those notebook videos that I'm talking about before we move on to the panel discussion. Hello students, welcome to Notebook. Have you heard the name Tansen before? Did you know he is considered one of the greatest musicians produced by our country? He was also considered one of the nine jewels of King Akbar's court. In Behat near Gwalior lived Mukandan Misra and his wife. Their only child, Tansen, was a very naughty boy. He would run and play in the forest. Soon, he learned how to imitate the calls of birds and animals. One day, the famous singer Swami Haridas was passing through the forest with his disciples or students. They decided to take rest in a shady grove. Tansen saw the strangers in the forest. He decided to scare them. Hiding behind a tree, Tansen imitated the roar of a tiger. The disciples scattered in fear. Swami Haridas told them that tigers were not always dangerous and decided to look for the tiger. Soon they realized that there were no tigers. The naughty Tansen was found hiding behind a tree. When he was brought before Haridas, he did not punish Tansen. Instead, Swami Haridas went to Tansen's father. He told Mukandan Mishra that his son, although naughty, was very talented. Swami Haridas offered to make Tansen a singer. From the age of 10, Tansen lived with Swami Haridas. He learned music for 11 years and became a wonderful singer. Sadly, however, Tansen's parents soon died. Mukandan Misra was greatly devoted to Mohammed Ghos, a holy man who lived in Gwalior. It was Mukandan Misra's dying wish that his son Tansen would visit Mohammed Ghos. Tansen began living with Mohammed Ghos. Tansen would often visit the court of Rani Mrignaini a talented musician herself. One of the ladies of Rani Mirgnani's court, Husseini, married Tansen. 
she too became a disciple of Haridas. Tansin and Husseini had five children, who were all very musically gifted. Tansin's fame grew, and he went on to perform in Akbar's court. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was one of the ten thousand plus videos that you would find on www.notebook.school. Should you choose to use that for your students. With that done, let me now have the pleasure and privilege of introducing today's panel to you. We have with us Dr. Sunita Singh, who is the principal at DPS Balotra in Rajasthan. Dr. Singh is an eminent and knowledgeable educator with a profound experience of more than two decades and possesses a rich experience of teaching and administration in many reputed public schools and organizations across India. She is highly skilled and a student focused educational leader. She is also a poet and author, and two books written by her are in the pipeline. Dr. Singh is very active as a keynote speaker on many current issues, especially NEP 2020. She is a positive parenting coach as well. She has been the recipient of Dr. EPJ Abdul Kalam Award, Bhishma, the Determination Award, Drona Award, Ideal Principal Award, Nation Builder Award by Arya Samaj, Rashtra Bhushan Award by FACE, Best Principal Award in District by SOF, and International School Award by British Council, and highly prestigious honor, Honorary Doctorate by Commonwealth Vocational University. She is the center superintendent and observer for many reputed exams conducted by CBSC. She is a CBSC committee member for affiliation and is serving as the All India Principal Association as state president in Rajasthan. She's had approximately 22 years of experience in the teaching profession and more than 10 years as principals of various institutions. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for making the time. We also have with us Varsha Chauhan, who holds a BSc and MA in English Literature, a BA and LLB, and is currently pursuing her PhD in education. See, she is a certified global career counselor from UCLA, the University of California in Los Angeles. She also holds a Master of School Administration from Lucknow University. She started working as a PRT with Red Rose School in Bhopal, moved on to become a teacher with the Royal Senior Secondary School in Jabalpur, where she then worked as the principal and currently is working as the director of the same Royal Senior Secondary School in Jabalpur. She has received letters of appreciation from the Education Minister, Mr. Smriti Rani, for excelling in class 12 results. Honorable CM Shivraj Singh Chauhan awarded the Captains of Industry Award in the field of education to her. The Rotary Club of Jawalpur awarded the Best Educator Award in the field of education. Excellence Award from the Rotary Club Jawalpur for outstanding results. She's been honored by the Sahodaya Group for being the best chairperson, renowned educator leader of Madhya Pradesh and district president of PSACWA. She's also received the IUEF Award in 2020 for the Divas All Round Persona Award in 2020. Also the Sri Shakti Samman Award. She's the PHF Rotarian and associated with many NGOs doing social work. Her hobbies are painting, cooking, and trying and implementing innovative ideas. Ma'am, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. I will stop my share now, uh, start the video so that we can see each other and start this wonderful discussion. Uh, Dr. Singh, if you could please uh, switch on your video as well. Dr. I Singh think she's having yeah. some net issues. Dr. Singh is having some net issues. Kindly oh, check. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, fine. No problem. Uh, ma'am. Should, uh, should I go? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Please. Okay. 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 Thank you, Subhayu. Thank you, all the yeah. panelists. Thank you, Notebook. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Philip, for giving such a wonderful introduction. Being a teacher, I try to motivate my students. I, I rather say action speaks louder than words. Being a teacher, being a principal, being a director of a schools, what you do actually, your children, they always uh, want to lead you. So here in the schools, we have to implement many, many of the th things. Here rather I would say, we have to involve parents more because that is the main today's demand. If you are not involving parents, you cannot go ahead with the schools. So parents involvement is best. 
in not over uh, for the academics but also for the overall development of the child because when you go with the ptas and uh, other things you know you have to discuss uh, about the social well being of the child mental well being of the child his uh, all the skills of the child so here you can put many of the core values to the students here rather than i believe ke we have to uh, teach students how to consume themselves in a very uh, low things in a very low price and how you can become a responsible citizen of india so here uh, we have to build all their critical thinkings we have to go with all their communication skills and then uh, basically we have to teach them ke uh, how you can bring the best in limited sources this is my core criteria as this year it was the pandemic you know in uh, my school what i did i just transferred all the books to the next class they they saved the money they got the books only they purchased the notebooks that's all so that is the thing every school should do rather than changing the books every time rather than uh, as uh, mr philip said ki we have to you uh, uh, less use of paper should be there so by creating so much of books and papers though we are digitally now this pandemic has made us everyone everyone digital so why not to make use of the technology as in this pandemic even a kg1 child has learned how to mute and unmute himself when the teacher just commands the child the child is able to do though the parents are there after them parents involvement is too much now in this pandemic so and as the uh, our uh, responsible consumption topic is there yes definitely we have to make our children very responsible the parents responsible through towards the society towards their uh, environment uh, towards the mother earth so here we have to teach the child ki when you are in the school how you have to play your vital role in the school premises how you can go with the sustainable things how you can apply your knowledge see in the class there are many things um, keyboards are there then computers are there many things are there that each after 3 years or 4 years we have to change it there is a scrap also so we have to make use of that scrap also make the children reuse that thing and we can give them the uh, challenge how you can uh, reuse the scrap how you can reuse the material how you can reduce it then uh you must have seen there are canteens in the school so we have to provide the children the healthier food and the packaging packaging materials also how the materials are packed whether they are in a healthy way or the packaging thing is uh, can we reuse it or reduce it or whether we can recycle it so this is not being taught in the higher or primary classes this we have to teach them uh, from the very Uh, like uh, when they are in kg 1 kg 2 okay if you are uh, wasting your food where you have to throw the foods and why to waste the foods see uh, some of the people you must have seen that they uh, go to the party and they take all the things and then they just throw off the they don't even eat the things they just throw off so it we have to cultivate this habit right from the beginning of the uh, years of the child then uh, using of uh, single use plastic then uh, we give them some investigations uh, how the waste and the recycling is being done then definitely uh, in the schools uh, there are lot of um, uh, bulbs lights and everything is there electricity is there so each and every child is responsible for it even the teachers sometimes we see the in the staff room also the lights are on uh, as nobody is sitting there but why to use it when you are sitting there you have to use it because the day will come we'll have to again go in search of light from where we can get and then pay a heavy amount 
and then we'll get the lights and other things energy service also so here we make it sure that every child whenever he leaves the classroom or his room or wherever he is not in the even in the toilets even in the libraries even in the canteens even in the labs he or she and even the teacher everybody is responsible for the use of electricity now the parents are the successful partners of the schools they play a vital role because uh, as a child grows as he is of a 3 years old uh, parents cultivate the habits more before sending the school so here we have to just brush on them we have to put more good habits to them and uh, here communicating is the best thing i should say uh, with the parents whenever we communicate the best they just because children sometimes smaller children they are not able to grasp what the teacher or uh, what their principal they want exactly from them so here the parents play a vital role like you must be seeing in this pandemic i am hats off to all the parents in this online teaching they are sitting beside their child and seeing what the teacher is teaching and then again they are recording and then uh, they are teaching their child also now this is the first home of the child so the parents are teaching the children then if they are having any of the uh, problems yes you have to volunteer them there volunteers in the school or classrooms we involve parents also as a volunteers many of the things uh, like when we go with the cultural programs or exhibitions or any 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 type of programs you have to volunteer them not only at home also but you can make them volunteers in the schools also then uh, we have to make the children uh, very uh, positive minded in taking a very good decision and then collaborating with the community if if in your community anyone is not uh, proper or throwing waste here and there the children we make the children that you make a group go to that house and just teach them what is good and what is bad like we have ngos also here the children they go with the teachers and to the remote areas and there they teach them about the hygiene and many many things they go ahead with that the they are also teaching to the smaller kids like i should say a five uh, five uh, he's in fifth class the child is in fifth class he is teaching a small child of class 1 so this way the teaching is going on now in this pandemic yes the uh, digitally we have been becoming very strong uh, mom uh, sorry to interrupt you before yeah. we move on to the digital aspect of things i just wanted to dwell on that parents piece for a little bit Uh, yeah we have the situation where uh, the parents are typically telling the child yes. that getting you know studying harder getting better marks is yes. a pathway to consuming more yes right okay. there are there are incentives like you want a toy study harder some day you will become rich enough to buy this yes so in a lot of in a lot of children's mind the parents are putting that equation that more studies is equal to more money at some point <laughs> which is i think very root to this whole consumer consumption issue Ma'am, how do you deal with that? No, no, no. Actually, you know, uh, we deal. A uh, lot of parents are like that. A lot of parents. If you are scoring very good marks, you will get a better place. You can survive better. You can have all the luxuries. Yes, but it is not true. It is not true always. Not always. It is not true. Yes, I have to deal. Then we have to counsel the parents. We have to tell them, "Kisi, the child. You have to go with overall development of the child." if he is good in studies i have seen number of students they were scoring 98 99% marks but their behavior is not good they are not restricted uh, they are not good to the society because their parents used to pamper them they used to like you said they used to give them toys and everything that you score and he was just after the marks mugging up and reading and getting good marks that's all nothing was there so now you see ke uh, through this nep we have come through the nep and uh, now the board has taken the decision there 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 will not be any uh, board exams for class 10 now how you will 
take out their percentage how you will do the calculation part it's a big challenge now the parents ke ma'am the uh, children did not give the board exams or they did not appear to the net issues because net issues is everywhere now yeah the parents they are having lot of problems with this net issues so how what will be his or her percentage now how we, uh, the child we know we know when the child comes to the school he's uh, with us for uh, since 9 years class 1 to 9th i should say and then 10th uh, pursuing 10th and then going for 11th and we know better so here we tell the children if the child is scoring 50% also maybe in 11 12th i don't say ke uh, any time the changes can come the child can do better i have seen the children who was at a 60 who was scoring only 55 and 60% yes because his behavior was good he was accustomed to the society he had a all round development he used to go with the newspaper he was not after the marks but uh, developing himself uh, getting the knowledge and everything he is a very good doctor or an engineer or a iit even the 65% can go with the iit and they are scoring millions dollars there in the uk and america so for that i am against k you are scoring good marks you will be getting a better things no the you should be a very good human being first of all what you are gaining you have to give to the society that is the second point and the parents they should not be uh, biased because you know the parents both are working so they don't have time for their children so that is why they say you take this toy and get 100% marks or 99% marks but now even the parents mentality is changing now we have to change the mentality of the parents like for the new generation the next generation parents they are now becoming like that they they don't want only um, study studies and studies they want their children to become all round develop and you see there are many uh drawing classes many cooking classes many things right in this pandemic going on now they have put their child into these uh, activities so that their brains develop and they are having all round development also yes ma'am thank you you refer to net issues i think uh, dr singh is still having net issues yeah. and so we uh, we can see her online ma'am in case uh, we can be of any assistance please reach out to us and we'll try and help uh Mr. Chauhan, if I may come back to uh, our the the part that you were just talking about, the digital part, right? With everything going digital, it yes. also means that students now have unrestricted access to social media. Yes. And we all know that social media is fueled by consumption, right? right? You are getting bombarded by ads. You are getting bombarded by your parents or or your friends posting photos of what they had for breakfast on Instagram. You are getting reels and uh, tweets. about what people are having or what people are buying how they're spending their money yes. how do you teach the child to be a responsible consumer in such an environment thank you mr roy you know technology it has become an integral part of our life without technology we are nothing so here uh, before we started this technology uh, before the pandemic started and even we were there okay, how the uh, teaching learning process will go on we came to zoom google meet every everything then we finally took the meeting of all the parents then we first guided them every month we have to guide the parents i should say every month even the children because you know uh, sitting at home the parents they have to keep an eye on their child because everything is open the children they take the mobile and tell the parents we are watching what ma'am has sent the video and though they are with the internet watching other um, sites they are going to other sites yes so we tell the students also even the teachers how you can control all these things like uh, there are many uh, safety measures also which uh, parents can make use of it and even the teachers they are making use of it and uh, you know previously what uh, it used to happen in the zoom also the children they used to send some messages and then we could not even uh, put praise them in the zoom but 
where when we did the recording and other use of technology we started doing that i hope in jabalpur all the schools have implemented that i don't know about other cities i hope but all the schools uh, they are going with the uh, technology and everything and then they are making children aware of it and even the parents how they uh, have to take care of their child sitting at home and what uh, limited period they have to give to the child i think uh, ma'am is having some net issue she has uh, logged out yes i think so ma'am mm. ma'am i understand that my my concern here is that uh, we have we have two very conflicting notions right on one side you are measuring success by yes. money right by how much can you buy your purchasing power your ability to get things that will perhaps make you feel happy because we have kind of equated happiness to having more on the other side we are telling them in the education system that listen it's more more important to grow holistically right and this can be told told to the parents and the students 10 times over but the fact is they live in a world where tv ads uh radio ads every kind of advertising is telling you that you know get a little more for 25% less buy one and get one free your phone now has 4 gb more of data your phone now has 3 yes. hours more of battery that more and less how do you bring students out of that mindset you know it is very difficult uh, this time is going on uh, to teach the students and you know even the parents are there in the same not only the students i should say uh, many parents are also involved in it uh, i should say in the school scenario also where there is a less fees the parents are going there <laughs> they don't see the content or other things uh they, and then they are where the uh, fees is higher and some parents are moving that side so that it's getting it is only a, you know a mentality of the parents you cannot change that what is your thinking you cannot change the thinking of a parent or a child what he wants we can only suggest them what is good what is bad that's all nothing more than that we can just guide them well bam for the sake of the students and the overall the planet i sincerely hope that parents will wake up and take notice i parents can see dr singh yeah yeah i can see that dr singh had joined back in now i think i think her her network is really uh, playing funny today ma'am thank you so much for your views i thank think you so thank you thank uh, you everybody in the audience has hung on to every word that you said Ochin, I think uh, you yeah. will have quite a bit to thank for. We've had such fantastic sessions today. Yeah, she's there. I think Dr. Singh has joined back. Uh, Dr. Singh, if you can hear me and if you can uh, join in. Dr. Singh, is your connection better? Would you be able to join in? I think we are out of luck when it comes to Ma'am's connection today. Achin, so I will leave you to do the yeah, official thank thanking. Thank you, Mr. Achin. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much, Ma'am. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Achin, over to you. So I think really a great session we had. Some uh, excellent takeaways for our esteemed audience. Bye, sir. Uh, thank you as always for giving us a great start and some uh, some really wonderful examples, real life examples. and uh, yes i completely mm, agree with you uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the menace caused by fast food eating habits changing etc indeed these are these are real life problems that we we really deal with so i think some great examples sir uh, thank you so much uh, christine ma'am again uh, i think very well explained some some great points uh, you brought forward including uh, the examples of uh, animals and birds really wonderful example indeed they really take only as much as they need and leave the rest couldn't couldn't be a better example than that and i agree with you completely uh, on with your views when you say that uh, containment appreciation is really important and using everything responsibly including technology and bandwidth as but it's also mentioned and yes talking less and doing more i guess that is very very important varsha ma'am uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, for enlightening all of us with your views uh 
I really like uh, you know your 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 practice of transferring books to the next class. I mean, really wonderful, wonderful. Uh, considering the fact that uh, it's it's also about saving trees, responsible consumption, and a great culture. You know, great example. Lakhs, eighty lakhs, budget hui hai. Eighty lakhs. Wonderful, wonderful. And also, you know, the kind of message it delivers, the kind of values you are able to inculcate in your children, in students. You know, I'm sure that goes a long way. It's it's a lifelong learning. You know, because always seeing is believing. You know, telling them something and they themselves participating in in something. You know, to kind of bring in their books for their next class or they themselves using books from their seniors. That's something that they this memory they're going to carry for the rest of their lives. Wonderful, wonderful. So undoubtedly, recycling, reducing consumption, and uh, also like for example, power consumption. As you very rightly mentioned, small small things, but very 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 important for the planet. And collaborating with community. I think that's very important. Very very important. And especially children taking the owners, forming groups, going and speaking to people, that has a lot of value. As we have also seen in case of traffic offenders, etc., in various cities, in various cities, we have seen uh, we have seen cops taking help of school children to go and ensure that people do obey traffic rules because that messaging is very powerful, very very powerful, right? So I think wonderful session we had. Great takeaway for our student educators as well. I thank uh, all of you for your time. during at this i understand that we are passing through uh, a difficult phase undoubtedly with this uh, second spike in second wave of uh, covid-19 a very difficult time indeed uh, my thoughts and prayers with each one of you please stay safe stay at home and my best wishes to all of you thank, thank you. you take care and good night good night sir thank you